Hello, sixth grade. I hope you're doing well during social distancing. Some of you may be getting a little stir crazy up in here, but I hope you're able to transfer that energy into learning about the history of China this week. First, do you know what these are? Do you know what people use them for? Yes, these are chopsticks. You know, when I was in China, some people took me out early in my being there to have a dinner at a restaurant called Hot Pot. Hot Pot is a type of restaurant where you and your friends sit at this table with a big burner in the middle. The server comes along with a big pot and you choose the type of broth or water you want to go into the hot pot. You then order various ingredients like different types of meat and vegetables to put in the broth. You cook it in the broth at your table and then you eat it when it's done. While this restaurant had no spoons or forks, I was handed a pair of chopsticks, which I had never quite used or whenever I had tried had never gotten the hang of. That whole night, I attempted to eat my dinner with chopsticks and it was a huge fail. I ended up just stabbing and eating whatever I could. Thankfully, I quickly learned how to eat with chopsticks after that and was prepared for every meal after. Although I don't use chopsticks as much anymore, I like to occasionally use them to keep that memory fresh. I thought I would share with you the history of the chopstick today. Two and my chicken. I got this information from an article on smithsonianmagazine.com. According to the California Academy of Sciences, chopsticks were developed about 5,000 years ago in China. The earliest versions were probably twigs used to get food from cooking pots. When resources became hard to find around 400 BC, chefs figured out how to conserve fuel by cutting food into smaller pieces so that it quicks fa cooks faster. This new method of cooking made it unnecessary to have a knife at a table. A practice that Confucius, we're gonna talk about him this week, did not like. He said, the honorable and upright man keeps well away from both the slaughterhouse and the kitchen, and he allows no knives on his table. By 500 AD, chopsticks had spread to Japan, Vietnam, and Korea. Early Japanese chopsticks were used strictly for religious ceremonies and were made from one piece of bamboo joined at the top like tweezers. Um... Some people in Asia, not every Asian country uses chopsticks. I know that when I was in Indonesia, their main way of eating was with a spoon. So not everyone in Asia uses chopsticks. In the early, um, during the Chinese dynasty times, silver chopsticks were sometimes used because they said if they turned black, that meant the food was poisoned. Now we know silver doesn't kind of react with arsenic or cyanide types of poisons, but it can change color. If you use silver chopsticks with garlic, onions, or rotten eggs, all which release hydrogen sulfide, which you didn't necessarily want to eat. Can you use chopsticks? Do you know how to use them? If you do, you're a way step ahead of Mrs. Bulwark, who learned how to use them when she was 23. Um, today, even if you don't use them a lot, there's a lot of nifty things that chopsticks can be used for besides eating. And some people claim that chopstick use can improve memory, which can always be helpful. I sometimes use it if I wanted to flip something or grab something, but not with my hands. I know my friend used to flip garlic bread with chopsticks. Well, we're not here to talk about chopsticks all the time. We're here to talk about the history of China. So yesterday you worked on a timeline that will hopefully help you be familiar with some of the things we talked about. If you don't have your textbook right now, get it out at this time and turn to page 754. Pause this video and turn to page 754. Are you there? All right. I'm assuming you're there. 
China in its history has had points of strength and at points of weakness. Mongolia, which is also covered in this chapter, has also experienced times of strength and times of weakness. Today we're going to talk about the empires of China and Mongolia. First, China. China's empire was based on agriculture, which is a fancy word for farming. The civilization began when farming villages formed on the North China Plain thousands of years ago. China was kept from other civilizations by high mountains, like the Himalayas, uh, making it hard to reach other neighboring countries and civilizations. Around 1800 BC, a series of emperors began to rule China. These emperors were usually part of a dynasty or ruling family that held power for many years. Your timeline yesterday talked about the Shang Dynasty, which was the first major Chinese dynasty. Archaeologists have found in the last capital of the Shang Dynasty 11 major royal tombs, foundations of palaces, weapons, um, bronze, jade, stone, bone, and ceramic artifacts, just like that one in the picture in your timeline yesterday. People in this dynasty wrote divinations on oracle bones that helped give historians an idea of just how life was like during this civilization. The Qin Emperor, Shi Huangdi, is a very significant emperor in Chinese history. He created a uniform or same written language for the whole empire and unified China to make communication easier. He also orchestrated the building of the Great Wall, which can even be seen from outer space today. Hopefully you got to check out the Great Wall, which can even be seen from outer space. I think I just said that. <laughs> and see the video of the slide. Hopefully you got to see that on Google Earth and then see that video of that person going down that slide. Shi Huangdi did not construct the slide. The slide was made later um, and is a great tourist thing to do. Mrs. Bulwark did it while she was in China and it was a lot of fun. Um, the Great Wall is used to protect, it's used to protect those farmers around the outskirts from enemies that would come over from the other side. Um, China has a really big agricultural foundation and some of those guard towers that you see would have been used as storage for weapons and food and for soldiers housing as well on the Great Wall. Although Shi Huangdi did help construct the Great Wall and that's very impressive, he also is known for another thing in Chinese history and it's his tomb or what is guarding his tomb. Huangdi was a very successful emperor and a conqueror and unifier of China, but there was one thing he knew he couldn't conquer, and that was death. So, during his lifetime, he had a huge tomb made for him and a palace around it, a city around his tomb. Um, he had a miniature makeup of China placed in it with rare artifacts, um, mechanical functions that help would move and rivers and um, a wonderful treasure and a giant statue of him overlooking his empire, overlooking China. The ceiling was covered with stars. It was just a wonderful place. Shi Huangdi was paranoid though that after his death, people that helped build this beautiful temple and the area around it, beautiful tomb, sorry, and the area around it would come and tell people and they would rob his tomb. Therefore, he found it very important that no one knew where this giant tomb and necropolis or city around his tomb um, was buried. And so after it was completed and he had died and he had placed, he was placed in the tomb and buried, the inner passageway to the tomb was blocked and the workers and craftsmen were trapped inside, unable to escape. They were buried alive. Trees and plants were then planted on the tomb to make it look like a hill. And it wasn't discovered for a very long time. But you know what eventually was discovered? Shi Huangdi had an army of terracotta soldiers built that would guard his tomb, a huge army, and they looked so realistic, these soldiers. Although the tomb itself has never officially been excavated for a couple of reasons, like fully excavated, one, to show respect. Um, China has a lot of respect for this emperor, so they don't want to necessarily disturb his resting place. Um, two, because of some of the stuff that's in there. I mean, they used a lot of mercury in his tomb, so they don't want to necessarily open that up. 
But the Terracotta Warriors is a very popular tourist attraction, including the areas around his tomb as well. Um, yeah, I never got to see it, but it was very, it's something that I probably would want to see if I ever traveled back to China. You can see a picture of a terracotta a statue of a warrior um, on page 754 in your textbook. So after the, after the Qin Dynasty ended, Shi Huang, um, next was the Han Dynasty. We talked about this in your timeline yesterday. Liu Bang, its founder, actually was a peasant, a poor person. Um, that's how he began life. Then he led a rebellion against the Qin Dynasty. And he had a dynasty that lasted for 400 years. Not that he was alive for those 400 years, but his family was uncharged for 400 years. During the history of China, roads and canals were built to make trade and travel easier. The Grand Canal is the longest man-made waterway in the world. The oldest parts of this canal go back to 5th century BC, and it stretches for 1,104 miles, and it even goes up mountains. Even past where we talked about Zhao, Zhao in the Mai story, Wuxi, where he lives, the Grand Canal goes past there as well. Chinese people also invented paper, silk, the magnetic compass, and gunpowder, at first for fireworks, then for weapons. Gunpowder, as you saw in your timeline, was established during the Song Dynasty. While the Chinese emperor empires were based, oh, my Atlanta. While the Chinese empires were originally based on agriculture, the Mongols' power came from their skills as warriors on horseback. The Mongols were people that moved around a lot in the plains north of China. They were united under the leadership of Genghis Khan in the 1200s, who led them over the Great Wall and into China and conquered it. Now, although we have statues and paintings of Genghis Khan today, I read that no one actually knows what he looked like. He didn't allow one, anyone to paint or sculpt what he looked like during his life. He also came up with the concept of a passport, using metal tablets to give to merchants and um, diplomats and government people to give them safe passage to travelers wherever they went. That gold tablet would be a don't hurt me or you'll be in a lot of trouble sort of thing. He also, besides being known as a very fierce warrior, was someone that was a great, um, great person to have in government with helping people with practicing religion and taxes, good with taxes and written language. Um, he also is known today to have maybe 16 million descendants. He had a lot of children. Um, these are the ancestors, not just those children, but every one of those Mongols that descended. Um, these are the ancestors of today's Mongolians or those that live in Mongolia. And the Mongolian empire was very large while it existed. And it was eventually, it was very large, but it didn't last very long. It was overthrown by the Ming dynasty in 1368 and that's where we leave it today we went through page 754 to 755 in the textbook take this time to reread those two pages you can then open up google classrooms classwork and click on the chapter 21 section 1 notes after today you should be able to answer questions 1 6 7 11 and 12. I'll see you tomorrow as I talk about important ideas and beliefs in China's history. Don't forget to press submit that you watch this video so I know that you are going along with the recommended pacing. I will see you guys tomorrow, but until then, I gotta get back to my rice. Bye!